Welcome back everyone to the channel. A special shout out to Matthew. What's up? Anyways, tonight's terrifying video. I am bringing you three terrifying deep woods stories. Spooky ones. Now sit back, relax, dim those lights, and let's get spooky. Some of you might remember me. I'm the traveling photographer who chases photos in strange locals. My story about the ghost grass hermit got the attention of a magazine that was interested in strange locals. It's not as much traveling as I'm used to, but I'd be lying if I said it wasn't nice to sleep in a bed more than on the ground. I've spent the night in haunted hotels in Louisiana, shrieking forests in the Midwest, and looking for strange creatures in the various backwoods of the American South. So when I got the message about checking out a forest in Maine, I was a little hesitant. This time of year, the weather is likely to be frigid, and blundering into haunted woods in the middle of winter is no one's idea of a good time. The check the magazine was talking about writing me, however, was definitely a game changer. So I packed my stuff and headed out. I had time to read up on it while I flew from Tampa, a skunk ape sighting that turned out to be a homeless guy, to Maine. Home to the king of horror and some pretty picturesque scenery. The locals claimed that the woods were the home of some malevolent spirit, it seemed. A spirit who made toys. Local legends said that people have been finding wooden dolls in the woods for years. The first being reported in 1860. Around 1850 or so, there was supposed to be an old man who lived in the woods out there. An old man who sometimes came in the town to sell homemade goods. He had the usual fare, bowls and animals and things. But his puppets were supposed to draw buyers from far and wide. He made enough from his hand-carved goods to live comfortably away from society. And most of the people just believed he was a harmless old man. One winter, however... A group of kids went missing. The town turned out to try and find them, but as the snow came down and the hour grew late, hope seemed to dwindle that they would never be found. They asked the old man if he had seen the missing kids, and he shook his head and told them he would keep an eye out for them. As the snow piled up and the winter wind whipped, the people in town began to wonder if he had maybe had seen the kids and just wasn't sane. Someone said that a few of the boys had been talking with him not long ago, admiring his puppets and hanging around his stand. They began to get a little stir-crazy, thinking about the boys and picturing all kinds of unnatural things he could be doing out there. So, in the dead of winter... They had gone out and broken down the old man's door, handing out a savage beating and searching every nook and cranny for the missing kids. Except, they never found any kids, and the beating they had handed down had been a little too zealous. The old man was dead, and when the snows melted, the town found the kids dead in a drift under a makeshift lean-to they had made to get out of the snow. The townspeople sure were sorry about what they had done, but when they went to dig the old man up so they could bury him in the churchyard, his body was gone. They said they had saw smoke coming up the chimney as well when they approached, and candles that suddenly went out when they knocked on the door. After that, the puppets started hanging in the woods. Some people admitted to having hung them up in memory of the old man, and the terrible thing they had done to him, but some of them couldn't be accounted for by the mourners. People went missing every now and again too, and some of the puppets began to look like the missing people. 
The forest had since been integrated into a state park, and the toy maker's cabin was one of the park landmarks. It had been well maintained, as had the surrounding woods, and lots of people came to see the toy maker's woods. When my plane landed in Portland, about three and a half hours later, I was raring to have a look myself. It was another three hours in a rental car from there, heading into the heart of Maine, as I followed the signs to the little town on the edge of the Maslow State Park called Buckloader. They were pegged as one of those rustic tourist towns, kind of like Williamsburg, but with less PR. They had done okay, I suppose. And it was likely thanks in part to the people like me who came and wrote stories about them. I rolled in right about nightfall and found people in long skirts and buckle hats closing up shop for the night. The tourists had either gone somewhere else or had turned in for the night. And now the blacksmiths and hunters and tanners could go home and watch TV and eat their dinner and get some sleep so they could do it all again tomorrow. The Hog's Mouth Inn was my destination, and I was glad to see it as I drove into the parking lot behind the building. The snow flurries had been coming down for the past two hours, and I was very glad I had thought to pack a winter coat when I left Florida, which had been a balmy 72 degrees when I got on the plane. The temperature gauge on my car said it was around 32 now, and the tourists were going to be in for a winter scene tomorrow, I had no doubt. After checking in, I decided to come downstairs and have a look at their after-hours show. The bar area was a series of long tables where guests and actors ate by candlelight and paid a pretty penny for their ambience. The place had a pretty steep price tag, for somewhere I was expected to sleep on a mattress I'd expect to see at a Howard Johnson and eat veggie stew and a bunch of guys in rough spun clothing. But the magazine was footing the bill for expenses, and I decided there would be likely no better place for getting local legends than right here in town. So, I sat at the bar, ate some lukewarm stew, drank a watered-down beer, and asked the woman in the apron if she knew anything about the legend of the Toymaker's Woods. Her eyes went a little wide, but it was clearly not the first time she had been asked. I wouldn't go out there if I was you. That place is haunted, and it has a dark aura about it. So I've heard, I said, setting the glass down and asking for another. So does the toy maker still leave puppets in the trees? She didn't seem to like the question, but it was probably the accompanying smirk that set her off. That smirk tried to tell her we both knew better. I was still pretty sure this was something the locals were doing to promote tourism at that point. An idea I wouldn't be divested of for a while yet. He does, and I think you know. You think yourself witty by making fun of our local legends, but there are still things in this world that can't be explained away so easily. You think that someone like yourself, someone who had seen the unexplainable and lived to tell, would be a little more open-minded. I was speechless. She had read my articles? How do you know I've... It's plain to see who have lived in the shadow of strange and terrible things all their lives. Let's hope you come out of the woods as easily as you came out of whatever it was you ran awful of before. I finished my second drink in silence. The bar maiden moving to the other end of the polished wooden edifice and shooting dark looks at me until I left my money and took my leave. I woke up the next morning to find a winter wonderland outside and had to make a trip to the local outfitters before setting off. One pair of hiking boots, some snow pants, and several other warm bits to cover later, and I went off. The outfitter had also sold me a map of the area which showed the start of the trailhead not far from the edge of town. 
It was a little longer than I would have liked to find in the snow, but I eventually oriented myself and found the toy maker's trailhead. The snow had turned the woods into a German fairy tale. And as I made my way down the snowy path, I couldn't help but feel a little like some peasant kid just trying to find his way back home again. With all that colorless terrain surrounding me, it almost felt like I was back in the ghost grass again. The sign at the start of the path told me it was about three miles to the toy maker's cabin. Not a very treacherous walk in the summer or in the spring, but in the snow it would feel more like five or six. The powder wasn't waist deep, of course, but I was keenly aware of the crunch, crunch, crunch of my new shoe boots as I made my way towards the cabin. I had my camera out and decided to take some pictures of the expanse winter landscape as I went. I saw signs of deer in the snow, some frozen pellets probably left by a rabbit. And when I went to take a picture of some long plants jutting from an ice pond, I saw the first of the puppets. I've been saying puppets, but I suppose what they were was marionettes. I inspected a few of them and found nowhere to put a hand to make their mouths move. They were sitting in trees, hanging from branches by their strings. Some of them lying on the ground in a heap, but all of them looked meticulously crafted and expertly carved. They were dressed in all manner of outfits, but a lot of them looked like they might be wearing jogging gear or hiking clothing. Some of them were definitely children, and seeing them hanging merely from the trees made me remember the story I'd read on the plane. Walking through all the snow made me wonder if this was what the kids had experienced as they trudged through the snow, cold and hungry, and just trying to get home. The farther I went, the more it seemed like I too could easily get lost out here. I was a tourist, but I could imagine that even the locals would be hard pressed to find their way out of here. All this white, all this ice, would cover up landmarks and make it much easier to get turned around. You could blunder around out here for hours just trying to find the right trail, only to realize you had gone deeper into the woods instead of closer to town. The woods were made of birches, spruces, and hardy old pines, and the snow bothered them not at all. They hung close together, bearing the weight of all that powder stoically, and amongst the limbs were the puppets I had come to see. Always those infernal puppets. When it began to get dark, I realized I had been wandering this trail for hours. It had been early morning when I left, eight or nine at the latest, and as I watched the sun began to dip a little, I started to get worried that I was lost. The map I had did very little to help. The area was unknown to me, and the landmarks that would have meant something to a local were just so much snow covering nothing. I still hadn't come to the toy maker's cabin, and with every step, I was less sure I was ever going to find it. I had hoped it was someone's chimney in town, but the closeness of the trees made me think it might be the cabin I had been looking for. The thought that someone had hiked out here at first light to pretend to be some creepy toy maker made me want to applaud his resilience. But I was hoping he had a snowmobile or something to get me back to town. Hell, I would settle for a guide to find my way back to the trailhead at this point. Whoever was up ahead likely knew the way out at any rate, and I was cold and soaked enough to want to be back somewhere warm. My hands shook a little as I came upon the cabin, my camera coming up as I clicked a few pictures of the dark wood dwelling. It was a single room cabin, nothing fancy by today's standards, but it was long and likely contained a loft above the floor. I could just imagine the workshop that must exist inside there, the tables and benches that held his creations, the wonders he must create there, and suddenly, I wanted to see it. I was right on wanting a peek until my knock was answered by something from a nightmare. 
The door opened with a long and ominous creak, and the inside was less than inviting. The shadows weren't particularly long outside, but the inside of the workshop was pitch black. The face that leered out had an unsettling toothy grin to go along with its coal red eyes. Its body was indeterminable, the darkness hiding it like a cloak. But its face loomed down at me like a jack-o'-lantern from a high shelf. He grinned at me from the space near the top of the door, and I felt my lower lip tremble a little as his eyes fell on me. Well, hello, traveler. You look cold. Would you like to come inside and sit by the fire? Its voice sounded like an echo from the pits of hell, but that wasn't what had decided me on backing away from the invitation. When the door had opened, a smell like wet copper had nearly bowled me over. It was a smell like blood, and I knew that if I went into that house, I would never come out again. No, no thank you, I said, trying to keep my voice from shaking. I was just wondering which way to get back to town. That way, it said, and I assumed it must have pointed. I'd walk with you, but I can't abide the light. It hurts my eyes, you see. If you'd like to wait inside till the sun sets, however, I would be happy to walk you back to town. I shook my head. No, thank you. My friends are waiting for me. I must be going. Of course. Hurry along now. As it closed the door, the partial creaking on swollen hinges, I heard it whisper. Wouldn't want to be caught out here after dark now, would we? I ran as fast as I could, using the puppets as a guidepost. Suddenly, their height in the trees made sense. This thing had been crouching to talk to me and I bet its arms would have no trouble placing these puppets in the bows of the nearby firs. They seemed to taunt me as I ran, enticing me to hurry. The sun might keep it inside for now, they seemed to say through their painted smiles, but what will happen when it goes down? I haven't been so afraid since I laid on the floor of the hermit's shack, listening as I wondered as if he was to kill me. I ran as the sun set, and fate must have been with me. The journey that had taken me all day seemed to end in a few moments, and I could soon see the town in profile as the sun set behind it. I raced the shadows in the town, expecting to hear a howl or a scream as the darkness allowed him to leave his den, and as I closed the door to the inn behind me, I saw the patrons at the bar looking up questioningly. The barmaid, however, seemed to know what had happened. As I came to rest at the bar, snow falling off my clothes, she set a mug of something hot down in front of me. Her look was knowing like she had guessed what had happened, but it was also sympathetic, like she understood what I had been through. It was pretty clear that she too had been to the cabin and possibly seen something that haunted her to this day. Don't worry, she told me. It doesn't come in the town. Never has. Not since our great-great-great-grandsires kicked in its door and murdered it for a crime it had no part of. It's called the Toymaker's Woods for a reason, and that's where it hunts its prey. I nodded, taking a sip of the mead she had put down in front of me. It was warm and thick and good. How many have gone missing in those woods? I asked, not really sure I wanted the answer. Not so many as you might think. Enough that the forestry service goes out with dogs a few times a month, but never after dark. It prefers to take the locals if it can. It remembers that the townspeople are responsible for its suffering, and it means to exact revenge a drop at a time. To its credit, it probably kills a few tourists if it can. Tourists are usually noticed when they go missing. The locals know to stay out of the woods or to accept the danger of what's going on. I stayed in Bucklauder for a few days. The snow drifts making me afraid to take my rental car back to the road. By the time the snow began to recede some, I had a great article full of Bucklauder's history and lore. 
My editor loved it. My readers loved it. And it definitely made an impression on yours truly. I had a little more respect for local color after that. Though it didn't stop my editor from sending me to strange and interesting places. I'm sure you will hear from me again sometime. But until then, remember to trust that funny feeling you get sometimes when you're out on a trail or hiking in an unfamiliar area. It just may save you from becoming a part of a local legend. Deep Violet had already chased the sun out of the sky by the time we pulled up to the trailhead. Crickets filled the cool summer air with their chorus, and a faint breeze played in the canopy of aspens. A three-mile hike stood between us and our campsite, all but guaranteeing the bulk of our trek would be in the dark. I suggested sleeping in the car and starting early the next day. This was mountain lion territory after all. They liked the prowl in the evening. My friends insisted we press on anyway. We'll just keep talking and stay together, Kurt said. They only pick off stragglers. And so we went, making idle chit-chat to ward off any possible predators. Deep in Mountain Valley, Night didn't fall so much as our visibility range dwindled, until I could scarcely see beyond the edge of the path. Snapping twigs and rustling brush punctuated the brief gaps in our conversation. At first, I paid it little mind. Most wildlife wanted nothing to do with us. But as the hours crept on and the other sounds of the forest faded away, I found my body tensing up with each creeping footstep in the dark. After a particularly loud crack, I whipped around my headlamp searching for the source of the noise. My light fell on a hideous sight just beyond the tree line. It looked like an enormous buck, one that had just climbed out of its tar pit, dripping with black ichor. Sickly gray skin clung tight to an emaciated frame. What little fur had fallen off looked greasy and matted, sprouting like clumps of weeds from the pale gray hide. John? Millie called from behind me. Yeah? I turned my light forward to find my friends were almost out of sight up the trail. How long had I been looking away? Keep up with your cougar food. I cast another glance between the trees. The deer was gone. After four hours of walking, we made camp beside a snowmelt lake. I kindled the fire, tending to it long after my friends retired to their tent. Each time the flames fell low, a pair of red eyes danced in the dark, glowing like embers. When I added another log, the presence would retreat from view. Despite the urgency I felt in my vigil, exhaustion eventually overtook me. John. Kurt shook me awake by the shoulders. Millie is gone. Did you see her? I jumped to my feet. How long had she been gone? How long had I been out? Can't have been longer than an hour since... He grabbed my arm and froze. Wait. Listen. On strained ears, I heard the sloshing footsteps in the distance. Someone was wading through shallow water. We raced each other down the embankment until we caught a glimpse of Millie. She stood a dozen or so feet from the shoreline, pale skin glowing in the moonlight. The inky water lapped at her thighs, reflecting none of the night sky above. Millie! Kurt hollered. She turned to look up at us for a moment before a second hulking figure came into view. My heart stopped when I recognized the shape as the same gray-skinned creature from earlier down the trail. The beast stood on two legs and cast us a disproving look with those hateful red eyes. It placed an almost protective hoof on her shoulder and led her deeper into the water. 
Kurt called her name again, making a mad dash for the water's edge. But Millie had turned back to us, walking deeper until the crown of her head disappeared beneath the surface. The animal's antlers vanished shortly after in a scurrying series of tiny ripples. My friend and I yelled ourselves hoarse, splashing around for close to an hour as we searched. No matter how far from the shoreline we ventured, we found the water to be crystal clear, never much deeper than chest high. When we ran for help, the sheriff didn't believe our version of events. Who would? Kurt and I spent days in a cell until the search party could finally dredge the lake. Once they determined we hadn't drowned her, deputies brought in cadaver dogs. This search too turned up nothing. Millie Palmer simply vanished that night, but the creature shepherding her into the depths didn't. It checks in on me often, on secluded trails or empty city streets. The location seem not to matter so long as it's suffocatingly dark, and there's water somewhere nearby. Each sighting, my pursuer grows closer, bolder. My questions grow as well. If I had let the fire die, would it have taken me that night instead? And what will happen the day it finally catches me alone in the dark? The smell of decay is a unique one. It's unlike anything else you'll ever experience. It's a smell that you can't wash away from a crime scene. It's a smell that sticks with you if you're ever unlucky enough to experience it. It triggers a fearful instinct in some, a morbid curiosity in others, and for some individuals, a little bit of both. It could be a body, an animal, a human, maybe something else. It could be roadkill or a murder. It could be relatively fresh or nearly mummified. And in some local legends, it's a smell that marks doom for any soul damned to such a fate. My name isn't important, as for I fear how telling this story will make me sound, well, absolutely insane, and frantically, I don't want that linked to me. But for the sake of introductions, I'll take up the name Ethan. This story takes place when I was only 17 and about to graduate high school. By now I'm 23, have moved, partially based on the following events and I've finished college, and I've started working as a crime scene investigator. A recent case brought this memory to the forefront of my mind, and I realized that I never got the chance to tell anyone back when it first happened, because I was, I mean, admittedly afraid of getting into serious trouble. I still am, but that's the good in being anonymous on the internet, right? And I guess that traumatized part of me inside hopes that someone from the area or surrounding had had this experience with it, or at the very least, can believe me. That's all it could really be described as. Unless, of course, you're from the area, and you know it by name. The Fur a Notch. Hi, my name is Ethan. I'm from Illinois, specifically Sycamore County. Go Coyotes, right? Well, in my teenage years, I've seen my fair share of crazy crap. And if I were here for this, I could go on for hours about my experiences. But one particular rises above the rest, and that's the one I want to talk about. Growing up, I never really had much stability. I was the oldest of three siblings raised by a single mother, who passed away when I was just eight. My little siblings were five and three. We were put in the custody of our aunt, who never really was around much. I found myself more than her being the one to make ends meet, at least as far as my siblings were concerned. My only real escape from that responsibility was school, and in junior high to high school, I spent any chance I could to be with my friends. We were pretty wild back then, 
at least compared to how I've since turned out. We often explored abandoned buildings, spray-painted trains, vandalized police cars, you know, teenager stuff. And being annoying nuisances of kids, we not only got in trouble, but we did the typical kid thing of spreading spooky urban legends as if they were true rumors. And for a while, that's what I thought the fur notch was. It's been a tall tale since I could remember. Even as a little kid, I distinctively remember even hearing adults talk about it. No doubt the stories had a profound impact on the local culture. You really saw anyone out after the streetlights had come on, especially not in the area I lived in, which was thoroughly surrounded by woodlands. Not really rural, but there were a good few hunting districts in the area because of the little mini patches of woods that made up a good part of the scenery. Some were hiking trails. The biggest of them was a park, and the rest were hunting ranges or just nothing at all. If you did see people out there after the sun began to set, you would never see them alone. At the very least, they would have one other person with them, usually all clinging to each other for dear life. For us, this was our Mothman. Everyone and their mother's dog had a story about the fur notch. This was such a prominent thing in our local culture that the curfew in place was specifically designed in consideration of that threat. It was a creature that thrived off of fear. It used humans' natural curious nature to lure them in, stirring them along an increasingly more morbid trail of sights until their fear was so intense that it could strike and feed. And make no mistake, this creature was ruthless. Easy to survive if you were smart enough to not act on your curiosity. But if you weren't, as long as you had the foresight to quit investigating while you were ahead, you'd be okay. After all, this creature fed off the fear. If you didn't give in to its bait, it wouldn't mangle and devour whatever was left of you when it was done. And the way it lured people in was the fabricated scent of decay and the expertly timed rustling of bushes or tree leaves to get your attention and get you on its macabre trail and lead you right into the belly of the beast. Of course, this was a tale so absurd, why would a group of angsty teens ever seen it as a warning? Why would they follow the curfew inspired by a presumably fox threat? when there was too much opportunity to mess around when no one was out and no one had eyes on you. Not even police got out after curfew because of the beast. Well, as you may have guessed, my friends and I were the teens who thought we were too good to listen to the stories and follow the curfew. It was a Friday in October, nearing the end of the month and the peak of fall, with winter rearing its ugly head around the corner. My friends, who for the sake of the story, we'll just call Spencer and Adam and I were hanging out after school. We always hung out at a small cafe down the road from the school until it closed at 6, and we were ultimately shooed off. It was the weekend, and we didn't feel like calling it a day just yet. Spencer was itching for trouble, as he had just recently gotten ungrounded, and he wanted to make up for lost time. Naturally, Adam and I were on board. Why wouldn't we, after all? So we hopped on our bikes and rode around town doing what we always did, looking for creepy and otherwise unsettling crap to stick our noses into and vandalizing whatever we felt like was in the way. Eventually, the sun had set and it was a little past eight, meaning curfew had already been enacted. Of course, the police only patrolled until 8.15, and after that, it was free reign for us. You know, there's one thing we haven't done before, Adam suggested as we biked to the park. Spencer and I both looked over at him when I piped up. What, murder someone? The question was meant sarcastically, and they both knew that, and Adam snorted in amusement. No, he said. We haven't explored the woods at night. 
We're already biking to the park. There's a hiking trail there, meaning... The expectant trail off caused Spencer to light up with excitement, already knowing what was being suggested. Oh, shoot. We haven't looked for that, uh, what is it called? The thing that eats people by luring them in with the smell of death or whatever. Ethan, you know what it is, don't you? He asked, glancing over at me. Before I could answer, Adam chimed in. Furinok, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And I nodded in agreement. Right. Well, what's stopping us? I have my phone on me and it's nearly fully charged. So at the very least, one of us has both a flashlight and a way to call for help if the boogeyman comes out of the trees to come get us. This caused us all to laugh. For some reason, we found it hilarious to poke fun at the whole thing. Well, no. I guess not for just some reason. It was because we were teens. Going against the status K was just what we did. As we made it to the park and biked through until we made it to the trail, I distinctively remember all three of us agreeing to split up. I can't remember exactly how that part of the conversation went, but we made good on our word and we did just that. We split up when we got there. We made it to the trail, climbed off our bikes, and let them fall to the ground in a careless pile. So excited at the prospect of exploring new territory. We were the very thing the Fur Notch preyed on. Curious humans who acted a lot tougher than they were. It didn't help that we were stupid kids at the time. And all self-preservation was overshadowed by the adrenaline rush of exploring the woods at night after being fed what, to us, was like the equivalent of a campfire ghost story. We looked at each other, me pulling out my phone for light. Spencer glancing down and laughed. I think I'm going to traverse along the trail until something happens. I have my phone on me, but the trail has a few lights scattered, so I'll be fine. It'll save some battery. He said. Adam and I looked at each other and nodded. Okay, cool. I guess we'll just explore each side of the woods, I suggested, to which Adam shrugged. Fine by me, he said. That was when we split up, as stupid as it was. Sure, at the time we thought it was all folktale, but even if it had been, splitting up was still stupid. There were animals in those woods who could easily hurt us. I guess we thought we were big and bad because we had phones. But I can't really say what I remember going through my head at that point in time. So I set off into the woods, my phone flashlight sweeping the area around me. The only sound I had being the ambience of the wind gently blowing through the leaves of the trees and bushes around me. And the chirping of crickets or cicadas. I'd be lying to say I could tell the difference. Still can't. For a while, nothing happened. I walked through the woods, phone in hand, looking for anything interesting. The most interesting thing I found up to that point was a cigarette carton with two unsmoked broken cigarettes in it and someone's old frisbee. It was sun bleached and weathered, so I could tell it's been there for a while. After about 20 minutes of absolute nothing, I decided this was boring and it was getting cold. I was ready to call it a night and go home. But then, as I went to call Spencer, I smelled it. The foul stench of decay singing my nose, bringing tears to my eyes. It was such a flooring smell, something that, at the time, I had never smelled before. And it was horrendous. There's truly nothing to compare it to. Ironically enough, despite the fur a notch being the whole reason I was in the woods in the first place. That wasn't my first thought. My first thought was, I'm bored. I want to get pictures of a carcass. Yeah, as morbid as it was, that was my thinking process. At the time, all I could think about was how gnarly it would be to get a photo like that. I knew I could get in some serious trouble, but I didn't care. I was a nosy 17-year-old 
All that mattered to me at that time was the shock value. So despite my growing repulsion and the feeling of nausea churning my stomach, I followed the horrid scent. I tried calling Spencer for real this time, but he didn't pick up. I just assumed he either had his ringer off or was being too brave to answer the phone, wanting to feel as alone as possible. That might seem like a stretch, but that's how he was. So at first, it didn't matter to me that much. It was when I started hearing the sounds like the rustling of something in the bushes around me, something big, that I actually remembered why I was here. And then I hesitated to keep going. Unfortunately, whatever sense I had that came through to the surface for long enough for me to hesitate was overpowered by my stubborn curiosity, and I trekked on. And it was not pleasant when I did. The first thing I saw was a small animal skull that was almost completely cleaned, but the bone was still stained red from its blood. I thought about picking it up and taking it with me, but for some reason, I just didn't. Maybe it was instinct, or maybe whatever was possessing me to be so reckless back then decided to sit this one out. Whatever it was, it was probably for the best. I kept going, and there was even more animal bones. Eventually, there were animal carcasses. Way too many to be right, to be normal, all decaying, covered in filth and maggots and the stench was absolutely terrible. So terrible that I didn't even bother stopping for pictures. I was already nearly overwhelmed by the initial smell of decay I was following that was getting stronger. I didn't need more. And as I continued, the trail of death just kept getting worse. Eventually, when I started seeing more, bigger bones, I knew they weren't from any animal. Not only were they too big, but no animal has a human skull in hand. When I saw that human skull, my heart sank. I knew I had made a terrible misjudgment. Before I could call Adam or Spencer, I heard the rustling again. The smell of decay was now so strong, I knew if I went even a step further, I was a goner. As I went to shine my flashlight over the rustling bushes, it flickered and went off. Crap, I muttered, checking to see if I had turned it on. I did, but it wasn't working. I was too scared to input my phone's passcode, and with trembling hands, that's when I saw it. Two piercing red eyes staring at me from the darkness, and they were rising. First to my eye level which was about 5'11 at that time, so it was already impressive. But then it went beyond. This thing had to at least be 7 feet tall. My heart particularly leapt into my throat when I saw a mouthful of rows of sharp, long, yellow teeth glinting in the subtle moonlight. As my eyes adjusted to having no flashlight, I saw its face. It was horrible. I can't even properly describe it in words. Its head was wrong, and its mouth protruded in a way it shouldn't have. Its red eyes had sunken in, and its face was thin and hollow. Its skin was so pale, it was almost white, and it probably would have been if it weren't for the dirty, tingy gray hue it had. This was the fur notch. It was thin, lanky, grotesque bean and suddenly it made so much sense how it thrived off of fear. How could anyone not be afraid? Instinct kicked in, and I bolted off running back the way I came. I didn't exactly memorize the path, but I didn't care. I told myself that I'd keep running until I made it out. And I did. I ran and didn't turn around for even a second. And I'm glad I didn't because I could hear its heavy, fast footsteps. And it sounded like it was on all fours, which is even more disturbing when I inevitably painted a mental image. Maybe that was a good thing, though, because I ran even faster, fearing for my life. 
I could hear its heavy, strained panting and its menacing growl for a long time as I ran. I was easily running for longer than 15 minutes before the noises stopped. I didn't care that they had. I had to get out of there. I kept running, and I didn't turn around until I finally emerged by the road leading to the park entrance. My phone's flashlight had came back on, and I hadn't even realized it until I stopped running. Once I was out of the woods, I finally turned around. I had expected to still see the beast, but I didn't, and I was undeniably relieved. Quickly, and still trembling, I tried to call Spencer and Adam, but neither of them picked up. I had to have called them a total of 40 times combined, but with no answer every time. Although I didn't have solid proof, deep down, I knew what happened. There was no denying it. I knew I needed to get home. So, staying along the illuminated path, I made my way back into the park where my bike was laying, and I picked it up. As I leaned up with it, something just told me I needed to look up right then, so I did, and I'll never forget what I saw. Adam's mangled corpse just barely visible on the outskirts of the side of the woods he had gone into. It was clear he had tried the run, but he didn't make it. The sight was so disturbing that I dropped my bike and doubled over, vomiting. His body was covered in what was easily all his own blood. His limbs had dislocated and bent at unnatural angles. His flesh was torn right through in many spots, and his clothing was shredded to rags. I never saw or heard from Spencer after that night but I knew he had suffered a fate like Adam's, and it made me sick to think about. It still does. When I could breathe again, I quickly hopped on my bike and rode back to my aunt's house. She, thankfully, wasn't home until much later, so I never had to explain to her where I was all night. I never told anyone what happened to Spencer or Adam, or even myself that night. There was a lot of reasons behind that, but the main one was fear. From that day forward, I was never sticking my nose where it didn't belong. I learned a lot of things that night, a lot of things I shouldn't have. The Furanok was more than a tall tale. It really was a serious threat. While all the stories about it might not have been true, I know what happened to me that night. I know when the missing posters went up. I know how torn apart the whole community was. I know what happened to me, what happened to my best friends. And I never doubted when people warned me after that. About anything. Whatever warnings I was ever given, I made sure to heed them. No part of me could relive those events. I moved out as soon as I turned 18. I moved far away and I didn't look back. I got accepted into a college in Michigan, and I focused on my career. I buried myself in work so I would never have to remember what happened that horrible October. I made a new life, and for a while, I thought I got away from it. I got a new job, I got a girlfriend who I was planning to propose to this summer, and she's due to have our first child in a few months. But when I got called to a scene a few miles from where I had been staying, the state of the body was something no one was expecting. No one except me. It was a teenager, about my age at the time of the incident, and the corpse was brutalized in the same horrible way that Adams had been. The fact that her body had been found in the woods behind her family's home made one thing all too clear to me. I was never supposed to get away from the fur knock that night. It followed me here. <laughs>